on. Oh. Wow. Yeah, it's on. Paul does good work. Thank you. We were having trouble with our sound system. And yes, and give Paul a hand for fixing it and setting it up and showing this uh, technologically challenged person how to do it for next time. I'm going to color code everything. I really am. It's so good to see all of you. This is our sixth year, as a lot of you know, um, and we could not have done any of this without the support of all of you. We appreciate you coming out, supporting our speakers. Um, most of you know the drill. After uh, uh, we have the talk, you don't get to ask questions here. You have to hold them, remember what they are, go back over to the Pawnee Art Center where we have some light refreshments, and uh, you can visit, uh, talk to Professor uh, Schumacher and uh, see what answers she has for your questions. So just remember, we're going to shoo you out as soon as she's through. Uh, we are so fortunate to have Professor here today. This is um, an unusual topic for us. We've been hoping to get somebody with some expert on expertise on uh, the uh, uh, native lands and the law, which um, I think some of us may have some notions about, and she's going to tell us if those notions are right or not. Um, uh, Jessica Shoemaker, Professor at uh, the University of Nebraska College of Law, and uh, she's visited us a couple times in the center, and she has very graciously agreed to do a program for us today. So, Professor Shoemaker, thank you. Gail. Um, thank you to Gail and to Roger for inviting me here in the first place, and thank you to all of you who came. I was pretty sure the audience was going to be only people I'm related to, so the fact that there's some of you I haven't met yet, that's super exciting. Thank you for that. Uh, I have been here before. I uh, love the Art Center. I thought that it was just a beautiful collection. My girls have enjoyed the root beer at Whiskey River. Uh, and Gail's recommendation. Uh, my partner in crime, Jason, his family is from this area, so we've gone to the cookie, what is it, the sweet shop with the cookie yeah. jars yeah. in St. Paul? Yes. Is that right? Yes. So, happy to be here. Uh, I am going to talk about native lands in the law. It's going to be hard for me not to take questions because I'm a professor, and actually, so as a law professor, I just ask questions of my students all the time, so what I really want to do is call on you, but I won't do that either. Uh, if I can't ask questions, I guess I won't or if you can't ask questions, I won't ask them either. Um, I wasn't exactly sure where to start this, so I decided just to start here. <laughs> um, these are my two sweet girls who both happen to be here. So there's Hazel, she's eight, and Annabelle is five, coloring in the back. Um, whenever I go to give talks or go to conferences and then I come back, they always say, did you talk about me? Did you show pictures of me? <laughs> so yes, look, I talked about you and I showed a picture of you. Um, the best part of me. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is not actually my sweet girls, but instead uh, Indian land tenure. I uh, am a property professor. I teach property law, think a lot about why property law matters, why land tenure matters. And I also work with the Rural Futures Institute on rural community economic development efforts uh, and property and how it relates to those questions. Um, so I think land and property is really important for everybody, but when you look historically, the law has been used uh, in a very particular and powerful way in uh, having impact in indigenous communities particularly. And if you actually look through the history of federal Indian policy, lots and lots and lots of federal Indian policy has been achieved through land law, through land reform and land actions. And so what I want to do today, I have two goals. I want to kind of tell the historical story, and obviously I only have 30 minutes or so, so it will be an overview. But zooming out from Dannenbrog and looking across the country, uh, I want to talk about kind of the story of indigenous lands and the law as they've developed in this country. Um, my work is actually focused on not just the sort of the sort of straightforward history that lots of people know that 
indigenous communities had land claims and lost a lot of them. Um, but instead, I'm more focused currently on the modern rules of the modern federal rules as they relate to Indian land ownership and the special and unique rules that apply only to Indian people in this country. Um, I'll spoil the sort of punchline. They're, they're not very fair and they don't work very well for a lot of Indian people. So I'm going to talk about that and kind of tell that story. And then at the end, I want to talk just a little bit about kind of where we go from here. So if you think about property law and what your rights are in your house or what the rights are along Main Street, it's a pretty hard thing to change because people develop expectations that they own this and someone else owns that and what their rights are accordingly. But a lot of people agree that these special rules of property that apply only to Indian people need to change in some way. Um, and so I'm just kind of starting to think about kind of what that might look like, how that might happen, uh, and even how the story that's happening right here in Dannenberg is potentially really important to that kind of larger movement. So that's where I'm going to go, or where I hope to go today. Um, here's where I just, so I said I was going to kind of tell the historical narrative. So this part will go through pretty quickly, but I think it's not a surprise to anyone in this room that, of course, upon, quote, discovery or contact by European settlers, uh, indigenous nations, of course, had property systems in place already, had territorial claims to spaces, but the Supreme Court, in a case called Johnson versus McIntosh, held that when Christian people saw this continent, uh, the Christian discoverers instantly owned all of the continent, and indigenous people had not title to their property, but a right of occupancy. So the magic of of discovery of site, right, changed property ownership pretty immediately, at least in terms of European law. So these indigenous property systems and land claims through a series of, oops, other way, uh, sessions, which almost all happened through treaties. So one thing that I think sometimes people don't maybe know right away or think right away, but most treaties were actually giant real estate transactions. So tribes would seed land claims to whatever territory was described in exchange for the right to retain the space that was re reserved to them, that they previously possessed, reserved to them, uh, and peace uh, and other um, terms. Now, lots of times those transactions weren't always fair, but they were real estate transactions. So this slide just shows the story, right, that we all know of land loss. Um, and displacement and moving of people from original territories to the current reservation system. So this is a map. The areas in green and blue are, uh, for our purposes, federal reservations. So this is the land that remains for indigenous nations, uh, 562 tribes. Uh, there's 56 million acres of land in trust, and we'll talk about trust status in just a minute. Uh, within these reservation spaces, uh, and then another 40 million in Alaska. Uh, and so what I want to do is talk more about not, not that historic land loss, although that's obviously super important. What I want to do is talk about the modern rules once we enter into one of those existing reservations about how land is owned and how it works and what it means um, for, for real people. Um, before I do that though, I just want to say, um, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about first is kind of the economic consequences of these special Indian land tenure rules. And property rights obviously have a lot to do with economics and market transactions. So if I put up the map of Indian reservations again and compared it to the places in this country where the greatest rates of poverty are uh, and the most difficult health and welfare conditions, uh, the overlay would be nearly perfect. So indigenous communities suffer the, and, you know, some have, are the exception to this, but lots of reservations have pretty dramatic poverty. Um, a lot of Indian populations, as you know, are still at the bottom of various social welfare uh, markers. 
Uh, also, so of that 56 million acres of land that's currently in trust within Indian reservations, 75% of that is agricultural. Uh, oh, you're fine. Uh, and the agricultural lands have been repeatedly noted as this is something that uh, tribes could really uh, develop as the greatest potential for economic development. Uh, but if I also overlaid where the most food deserts are, every Indian reservation, with just very few exceptions, is also a food desert. So there's this retained land resource, but a lot of poverty at the same time. And so one of my theses is that the land tenure rules that we're going to talk about are really a, a big part of that problem, right? So there's physical resources, but the rules make that so difficult to use that resource that it explains a lot or contributes to a lot of Indian poverty. So we're going to talk about prop property as it relates to money, because it does, right? It has this important economic component. But I put this slide up just to note that, of course, property actually does a lot more than just decide who are the haves in our society and who are the have-nots. So property not only is a resource that we can monetize and invest in and use as collateral, um, but property has other meanings. So it can mean things to us. I, I could have put up a picture of our family farm, right, which means a lot to my family. Um, the Black Hills, of course, are quite famous for the cultural and spiritual significance to the Sioux Nation. Uh, the settlement that the Sioux received for the taking of the Black Hills is now worth over a billion dollars, and the Sioux tribes still refuse to take it, because to them, it means something more than the money. And of course, the other potential elephant in the room today, as we talk about Indian lands, is the ongoing protest and issues around the Dakota Access Pipeline uh, in North Dakota. This is the, you know, one picture of the protest. It's kind of hard to get news, right, about what's really happening at the protest. It hasn't been covered quite as much as other, um, as you might think that it should be or would. Uh, but there's this ongoing dispute about how the land, just outside of a reservation, actually, uh, can and should be used and what the tribe's role in deciding whether that pipeline should be permitted or not. But that's about much more than just economics. That's about environment, culture, the ability to make choices about what happens in your important space. So property has all these meanings. I'm going to come back to that. I just want to say that out loud before we talk too much just about the numbers and money. All right, so now I want to tell the story of uh, why we have these complicated rules that I'm going to tell you and argue, or at least suggest, uh, are so detrimental to Indian economies. And it all st starts with this federal policy called allotment. So do we uh, hands? Well, I can't ask questions, so I won't. But um, <laughs> allotment is the federal policy. Let me just skip to this. So. Um, we got, we went through land sessions, westward movement of tribes, and those original maps showing that tribes have eastern land claims and then had to keep moving further and further west. We know the story of removal, where tribes, in the Pawnee were in Nebraska, got removed to Oklahoma, and of course the Georgian tribes that, or the um, southeast tribes, the Cherokees and others, and the, the famous Trail of Tears removal to Oklahoma. Those are all physical displacements and saying, you are here, now you go over here, where you had this much, and now you have less. Allotment's a different policy, and many people think it's actually the most problematic Indian land policy that's ever happened. It's what tribes still struggle with the most, uh, or a lot, at least. Uh, and so allotment was a policy in about the 1880s. There were some experiments with it before then. But the idea was, all right, we have created, we have recognized Indian nations have reservations. We'll do these treaties. We agree in the treaty that the reservation space is Indian nations' reserved territory where they can express their powers of self-government, express sovereignty, develop their own property institutions or reaffirm pre-existing property institutions in terms of how they allocate rights to different resources, how they um, coordinate, uh, limit what those rights and responsibilities are to the resource. But the federal government, although we had these reservations and it was sort of this isolation, separation policy, the desire for more land didn't end once we had reservations. And there was also a concern that 
from the federal government and state government's perspectives in 1880s, again, overgeneralizing, but a lot of these reservations didn't have kind of productive agriculture or productive economies even, or anything close to that, and the way that Western settlers wanted, right, or what we were used to. And so the federal government said, we will just uh, do this process of allot, sorry, process of allotment, and what we will do is we will reach into reservations where we said, you tribal governments, have your own space, do your own property, be your own government. The federal government reached in and said, we changed your mind. We actually want to give you, give you private property because we have this really evangelizing sense that uh, if we just give private property to Indian citizens, property is so powerful, which the property professor in me loves, right? Property is so powerful that if we're gonna choose a tool to encourage the assimilation of Indian citizens, we will use property to do it. So we wipe clean whatever resource arrangements exist within reservations, and a federal agent literally goes on the reservation and starts allotting what had been reservation land to be allocated by the tribe to individual Indian citizens in a square on a grid, and it was usually 40 to 180 acres, depending on the reservation. And the idea was literally that we will make Indian citizens go from this, or sort of stereotypical vision of what Indians are, to this by giving them property. And the idea was, they actually, there's actually these great quotes about, this will work so magically that this will just be a self-acting machine, any problems that might be possible in this new private property system will just melt away like snow in the springtime. It's a famous quote. Uh, and that what would happen was that Indian citizens would become individualistic via private property. They would start farming like their white neighbors. And then they'd be sort of the Jeffersonian ideal of good American citizens, disconnected from tribal governments, and we would just assimilate Indians and then literally remove the Indian problem through private property. Now, that of course didn't happen. <laughs> uh, none of that worked really as planned. Uh, there were lots of issues with allotment, but the, the most sort of simplified thing I can tell you is that as historians and economists have looked back at the data, Indian agriculture, which was the number one purpose of allotment, which was to promote individualistic agriculture, plummeted. So there was product, more productive agriculture before we put the system in place than there was immediately after. And there's lots of explanations for it, but part of it was, well, there was no sort of resource. This is a totally foreign way to live, to farm, to produce crops. Uh, wiped clean whatever had been working before, but it also made the land title really bureaucratic. So what happened was when we gave individual Indians private property, we didn't give them full, what we would call fee simple ownership. We didn't give them the entire title to the property with the sense of you do whatever you want with it. It was put in a special status called trust status, and the trust status was intended to be temporary it was intended to last for 25 years, and the idea was after 25 years, once this protective trust status has ended, once Indians have assimilated, then we will remove the trust status. But, uh, and the trust status included a restraint on alienation. So uh, indigenous citizens who were allottees, own land and trust, uh, could not just sell their land, but then it turned out they couldn't do lots of other things with their land either because the federal government as trustee wanted to manage a lot of choices about how that land could be used. So they couldn't consolidate it or rearrange who had what relationship within the family to the land. Um, they couldn't write a will of, to dispose of the property. Uh, eventually the federal government started doing a lot of leasing and saying, well, you're, you're not really farming the way that we envisioned you farming, and so we're gonna lease this land, or we're going to just deem it not in trust anymore. And then there are these, I'm gonna say great, but it's not normatively great, but very detailed and um, vibrant histories 
um, that are told about the federal agent coming through with a, a competency commission who would say, we deem you competent, your land is no longer in trust, now you're a citizen and you can sell your property freely. And then literally right behind the agent would be this um, land speculator who would come and say, here's a couple pennies on the dollar, here's your land, or a tax foreclosure sale would happen. So a lot of land loss happens at this time too. Now, the thing that's important is that, so allotment is deemed a failure pretty quickly. By 1928, the Congress has this famous report called the Miriam Report that says, okay, we acknowledge that was really dumb. <laughs> that, that wasn't gonna work. People weren't gonna just change their whole sort of relationship to space and to each other um, and their motivations because of, of top-down property reform. And so we acknowledge that's really dumb, so what we're gonna do is make the trust status permanent as step one, that happens in 1934, uh, which has some benefits. So the trust status becomes permanent so that there's no more risk of alienation to land speculators or tax foreclosure sales, because while the land is in trust, it's not subject to state property tax, and that there is this restraint on alienation. So uh, land and trust cannot be sold without the federal government's approval. That's still the rule. Um, the thing is, so that trust status has become permanent now as a practical matter, and it's highly bureaucratic, right? There are a lot of steps that a landowner has to do that off a reservation, I don't have to do if I want to sell my property, give somebody a right to use my property, lease my property, and just do that. If I want to give it to my children or make changes in that way because it makes sense for our family, um, I could just do that. The Indian landowner has to go through the federal government and get approval for the trust status. So it's a very expensive system. Now, so these restrictions are pointed to as one thing that contributes to economic inequality and economic challenges in Indian country. So tribes can't really, as a practical matter, tax trust property because the federal government holds title. So if you're a government and you don't have any property tax revenue, it's pretty hard to be a government without revenue. So that uh, limits what tribal governments can do. You can't sell your property, so you also can't really mortgage your property in any sort of efficient way. So if we look at how citizens off-reservation invest in things or build wealth, it's by using your house for a home equity loan or getting a mortgage in order to even build a house in the first place. All of that is super difficult on trust property because of all the steps of um, federal oversight. Now the other thing is that the trust status also relates to the second problem in current reservation land tenure, which is that we don't now have just one allottee who owns 180 acres in this difficult trust status. Now on many, many of the original allotments, we don't just have one co-owner, but we might have hundreds or even thousands of co-owners. So let me just kind of explain how this happens. So this is just a sample um, over multiple generations of if I didn't have a will, and I'm the original allottee there in the solid green, and I can't write a will at the beginning of these federal rules, later can, but have to go through a federal process again. But if I can't write a will, well then intestacy will take over, which is the default set of rules about who gets what if the, the person who dies doesn't have a will. And intestacy at the time, uh, it wasn't tribal intestacy that was recognized and said you would just look to state law. And so state default rules that typically said things like you'll just share all your property equally among your children happened. And so then you had one generation of intestacy. Now you have three children co-owning property. And then when those children die, they through intestacy give it to their children to share. And then those grandchildren die. And after many generations, we end up with not just a reasonable number of co-owners, but a whole bunch of people owning property. It's often hundreds or thousands of co-owners. It's really quite extreme. Uh, and remember, part of why that persists is because not just this difficult will rules, but if I have a really tiny interest in an allotment, say I own 2% in the allotment, I can't sell that. There's no tax on it, so there's no moment at which it becomes too expensive for me to maintain it. 
And anything I want to do with it, including just gift deeding it to my sister so that she and we can consolidate our interests, has to go through this full formal process with appraisals and review. Um, and so it exacerbates this problem, right? A rational owner would just do nothing um, and just let the interest get smaller because to do anything is so expensive. And so the reality is that, um, that's pretty hard to see, but uh, the Government Accountability Office in 1992, so people have been talking about this co-ownership problem since the 2019-28 actually, so for a long time it's been recognized that this doesn't make a lot of sense. In 1992, the Government Accountability Office looked at 12 reservations just to get a sample of how extreme the numbers were. And, I mean, it's crazy, right? It's like, you know, um, one per the smallest owner on an allotment might, after five years of leasing, get a check for a penny, right? Like, very, very small interests. Uh, and all, on all 12 of those reservations, the GAO found at least one interest that if you actually could physically partition it, which you can't through the current processes, but if you could actually separate it from all the co-owners and just have your own space, it would be smaller than the piece of paper the report was written on. And so this obviously adds to the problem of you can't build a house on a co-ownership interest with 500 co-owners um, where your interest is so, so tiny, and all those economic issues just kind of build on themselves. Now, the other thing that I just want to note here is that, you were right, my dad told me I wasn't even going to look at those pieces of paper and they're getting in my way. Um, the other thing is the related to this, and this all stems from allotment two, is this problem that's called the jurisdictional checkerboard. So now I'm going to tell you the third part of the story, which is that allotment didn't just give to individual or recognize an individual Indians a solitary individual claim to part of the reservation. At the same time, the federal government said, you know, if we've allotted all of the land to the existing tribal citizens and say 100 acres each, and there's some land within the reserved areas that's left over, well, we, that's surplus, and so we should sell that. So the federal government started selling a lot of the land that didn't get allotted to individual Indians within, remember, these spaces that were supposed to be reserved for tribal territories, and said, we'll just sell it, uh, and it will also have the benefit of moving along our assimilation goals, because then we'll have white farmers physically next to Indian farmers, and they can kind of learn from each other and break up the tribe even more. And so, uh, lots of land, gets sold this way. Here's some numbers. So if we say 1887 was the start of allotment, it actually started a little before that, but that was the nationalizing the policy. Until 1934, when the Indian Reorganization Act formally said no more allotment because it's bad policy. Uh, the tribes lost uh, 70 million acres, is that my 90? It's like, my math is suddenly bad. 90 million acres, um, a lot, like way more than they retained um, of their land. Today, that's gone up to 56 million in the lower 48, but that's from reacquisitions and a concerted effort after 1934. But the problem isn't just land loss, it's the pattern of land ownership that exists within reservations. And so well, reservations used to be exclusively tribal territory that the tribe would allocate resource rights to, allotment said, all right, there's going to be this thing that we'll call individual allotments, that we'll call individual trust lands. There'll be some land that the tribe will retain that will become tribal trust, but all of this land that we sell in surplus land sales or in those competency sales right after a, a, trust, a fee patent was issued, uh, that becomes not citizens of the tribe, non-Indian landowners who own their property in what we would call fee, right? Just in traditional, kind of normal off-reservation, not normal, but sort of what we're more familiar with, off-reservation uh, fee ownership. And that's typically subject to state law. So not always, <laughs> uh, sometimes, which uh, here's a map of Pine Ridge. So we started at the gate post, the sign entering Pine Ridge. This is just a map of who actually owns what in Pine Ridge. So I think sometimes we think reservations is just reservation land as kind of one monolithic thing. In fact, it's this mix of things. So purple would be tribal, yellow is allotted, and then the white is all non-Indian fee. 
Now the problem is not just um, where property tax applies, but all sorts of other things. So who gets to zone the mixed checkerboard land? So tribes have jurisdiction over tribal citizens. Tribal jurisdiction over non-citizens is more murky in current jurisprudence. But state's ability to exercise jurisdiction in a formal recognized reservation can also be murky because they don't have jurisdiction over the tribal trust land, that's federal and tribal, but they do have jurisdiction over the white, non-Indian land. And so you get this patchwork of, my property here might have one set of rules and then across the street there's a whole different set of rules. And so trying to, of course there's just waste, right, and duplicating government efforts, but it's also very hard to do things like environmental protection, land use planning, kind of any governance if you're in such a kind of complex patchwork of rights. And then the last thing I would just say is that kind of back to this initial point that property is actually about more than just economics. So the individual allotments were explicitly intended to promote a particular view about what property and your relationship to a space should be. It should be about improving land, extracting resources from it, um, being as productive as possible, individual power, individual money, uh, and clearly indigenous notions, you know, again, overgeneralizing and every tribe is very different, but had different values about space, right? That space had a different meaning that was about connectedness and stewardship and community uh, that's very different than what allotment was designed to do. And that federal overlay, that top-down it kind of feels like a cage, right? It's this method of containment through the law of this is how resources will be controlled and it will be through this process that is not locally defined, is not defined by tribes as sovereigns, although tribes as sovereigns do have an increasing role, so there is some federal change and they're sort of trying to move in that direction, but it's a top-down system that has had a lot of experimentation over time uh, and a lot of, kind of uh, not so great consequences for Indian nations. Now anybody that actually studies tribal economic development and reservation communities finds just again and again that the actual most effective way to address Indian poverty or to encourage tribal economic development is to let the tribes do it, right? To get out of the way uh, and if local decision makers who have a stake in what's actually happening in their community makes that decision, they far and away exceed external decision makers in terms of quality and output and actually addressing that uh, Indian poverty problem, um, which I'm using as a shorthand for a much more complex set of issues, of course. Now, um, what I just wanted to sort of leave us with, though, is that the problem is so, <laughs> it's easy to kind of stand up here and give, tick off the list of all the ways in which the system is kind of dumb, right? It's doing things that don't make sense. It's, as in American taxpayers, it's extraordinarily expensive for us to maintain this system. And it also just doesn't really benefit um, anybody. There's all sorts of sort of complexities about it. But the problem is what to do now that this is the system that we have. And so I will say, um, and, <laughs> We'll likely have questions about this, uh, not here, but over the street. Um, there's certainly, uh, there's one kind of knee-jerk response, and so there's a sort of growing surge of, um, well, we should just kind of erase the federal system and make this into pure free market property, and if we just didn't have these restricted trust statuses anymore, then indigenous landowners and tribes could enter the market more freely without the cost of this bureaucratic system uh, and their economies might dramatically improve. Now, I actually think that's a terrible idea um, and for lots of reasons, but it goes back to a couple of things. So one, we've got this problem of fractionation, right? We've got hundreds of co-owners in many of these lands uh, the federal government's actually in the process of buying back some of those small interests as a way to consolidate. It's actually as part of a trust accounting settlement in this kind of famous cabal litigation that I'd be happy to talk about after as well. So the federal government's in the process of trying to kind of buy back some of those, but the federal government also acknowledges again and again that it's totally its fault, right? That the federal government caused fractionation. 
So at just sort of a, a fairness level, right, just to remove the federal government from maintaining those tiny interests is just unfair, it's just not right. But also, if you think about tribal governments as governments and as sovereigns, the way that federal jurisprudence and Supreme Court jurisprudence is working is that in order for a tribe to assert governance authorities, this is oversimplifying, but it's really got to be a landowner, or one of its citizens has to be a landowner. So it's kind of a unique structure of jurisdiction. So if someone from Iowa, God forbid, right, bought property in Danabrog, Nebraska would still have jurisdiction over that Iowa citizen because Nebraska has territorial jurisdiction of all properties within its boundaries. And that kind of makes sense to us because this is the physical resource here, and so Nebraska as a state is in charge of here, regardless of who buys property within these boundaries. Now in Indian country, it's different. So if a non-Indian purchases property within a reservation or owns some of that checkerboarded property within a reservation, it's not so clear. There are some cases in which a tribe could have jurisdiction over parts of that property, but not categorically and not clearly. And in lots of cases, the state would have jurisdiction. And so the fear is that if the tribes start losing more land without things like the alienation restraints or the trust status, then the entire right to govern in a space is gone, right? The land is the last kind of buffer for tribal sovereignty. And then it has all these important other values, right, that I wouldn't even pretend to really be able to speak to with any kind of expertise, except I know that they're culturally and socially and spiritually really important in, in certain cases. Uh, and to just lose all of that is, is unacceptable, right? Um, and so instead, try to think about, well, what can you actually do to make this a more coherent and rational system? And that's also hard because even if we look at that checkerboard pattern in Pine Ridge, all of those individual landowners have a vested or at least an expectation that this is theirs, including the individual Indian Alatis, right, are, are tied down to that property right, that this is mine. And it's also just not that easy, right? So, we, so shaking that up is hard. Property. And then also we just don't, you know, top down property systems where we just like wave a wand and say poof, we'll just try a whole new approach to land tenure. You know, really the one great experiment we have with that is allotment and that did not go so well. Uh, and so instead property actually develops, if you look at other, prop other jurisdictions, property actually develops naturally in this really iterative and experimental way with small steps as we go. And so what I've been actually, what my current project is actually working on is trying to think about how to make space for that, how to make space for actual local flexibility and experimentation in a way that would ultimately allow for the evolution of more rational property systems. And I would love to talk about that more, but I have just a couple of things I would highlight. Uh, the federal government is trying to do some things to increase tribal sovereignty with respect to land in reservations. So there's some new legislation that allows certain tribal governments under certain tribal conditions, certain conditions to, for example, lease their own property without getting federal approval. There is that buyback program going on where individual allottees can, um, sell, will, if they're willing, they can sell their small interests and have that interest transferred to the tribe. Um, and sort of lots of other kind of innovations around sort of, I would say sort of at the margins, you know, where we sort of start um, federal action, but instead there's also kind of really inspiring stuff happening um, within tribal communities themselves. And so one thing that I'm working on, and I'll also be happy to talk about after, is um, some of the efforts around food sovereignty. So I told you that most reservations are kind of ironically food deserts, although most of their resources are agricultural land, and it's because of the system that makes it really hard to develop that and use that. So there's a lot of people who are doing really good work on local food systems within reservations and trying to not just produce more food, but you know, own and, and build the entire system of food production, food processing, food distribution, food marketing. Um, and there's really great people who I just put up here to say, smarter than me, better than me, doing really great work on food sovereignty. But the interesting thing is as that kind of movement for food and, and control of local food grows, it actually builds a lot of momentum for land reform too. So, you know, where gaming and other things have been uh, important for, for steps for some tribes to make have any revenue, food sovereignty is a totally different ball game because it's 
land intensive, resource intensive, and can really reflect cultural values in a way that other economic development um, efforts have not necessarily. Um, the White Earth Land Recovery Project. I just love this because I put American Gothic up as the, you know, the goal of allotment. And now there's kind of a reclaiming of that idea um, that we, we'll do what we want to do. And Winona LaDuke is sort of famous for her White Earth Land Recovery Project, which is buying back land, um, preserving wild rice strains, marketing, food, taking care of natural resources. Uh, so there's also kind of exciting things happening around there. Um, of course, the pipeline protests are stirring up a lot of energy and a lot of uh, kind of pan-Indian movement and effort around land control. Uh, interestingly, it's actually, some of it's tied to agriculture too. So uh, the Ponca tribe just replanted corn that hadn't been planted for almost 140 years, uh, uh, an indigenous strain of uh, sacred corn um, along the pathway where the Keystone Pipeline was proposed as part of the protest. And there's something that's really kind of symbolic about that. Uh, and then there's other methods that are happening too. So Ho-Chunk, uh, Ho-Chunk, um, or the Winnebago tribe in northeast Nebraska uh, is doing really well economically because they have a pretty ambitious and aggressive economic development engine that's working for them. But one thing that I think is interesting is that they've actually just decided none of this trust land is working for us, and so they just have fee land that they've purchased within their reservation, and they're just building a new town on top of it. So they just said, let's just design a town the way we would want a town to look, design who gets what rights and what land tenure is in that space, and we'll just build it. So that's pretty exciting, um, and it's another model. And then here. So actually, I think what's happening in Dannenbrog, the little that I know about it, is actually another kind of percolation of something really interesting and, and potentially really important. So one thing when I work with tribal governments or tribal communities that I say a lot is that, you know, you're going to be neighbors forever, right? The, the non-Indians aren't going anywhere, the tribes aren't going anywhere, and there are certainly reservation spaces where you know, there's a lot of conflict still, but the places that can really work together and acknowledge we're gonna be neighbors forever, let's just do this the best way and most cooperatively way that we can, um, you know, I think have the most potential for success. And so the fact that the Pawnee Art Center is in the center of the Danish capital of Nebraska and that Roger gave us land, and there's some really beautiful things happening here. I wouldn't sort of purport to speak to what their ultimate significance will be, but it's this, this little like, glimmer, right, of a different way of doing things uh, that might ultimately feed into just a different way of doing property in Indian country, which I think is what a lot of people hope for. And I think I'll stop there. Well, let me take over. Okay. Oh, I think we can clap louder than that. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. As as always, um, you're invited over to the Pawnee Art Center, and we will have refreshments. If somebody cook, I do not cook. Um, so anyway, uh, I will let you go there, and we usually let her go first, and then everybody else can trail after her because we've got. I've got to lock this down. <laughs> yeah, I have locked this down, and you can leave your stuff here if you want. Okay.